An artifact is the most powerful type of magic item. In terms of rarity, you have common magical items, uncommon, rare, very rare, legendary, and then artifact. But the real difference that separates an artifact from the rest is that the item in question cannot be recreated or duplicated. It is a unique result of the creature and environment that resulted in its creation. Furthermore, the artifact is immune to all damage and cannot be destroyed unless via a very specific weakness. Think the One Ring from Lord of the Rings. It can only be destroyed in the fires of Mount Doom. The famous Ring of Winter from the D&D novels and from Tomb of Annihilation can only be destroyed if Titania, the Summer Queen of the Fae, were to wear the ring in her finger. The Wand of Orcus can only be destroyed if it is bathed in the blood of Tiamat's heart. There are many hidden ways to destroy the Book of Vile Darkness, but the only way to destroy the book permanently would be to eliminate evil from the multiverse completely. Then the book would crumble to dust. Artifacts have seemingly limitless power and are basically indestructible and are by far the rarest items in the multiverse. I have created here a list of my personal top 10 artifacts in Dungeons and Dragons. Now know that this is not a list about which magic items are the strongest. That is our next video. For this video we're simply talking about which artifacts spoke to me personally and artifacts that I like the most in my time doing D&D videos and going through all the research that I do. The reasons why I chose most of these artifacts is literally because I thought they were awesome, or the backstory of their creation was epic, or maybe there were things that I wish I had as a player or as a person. Now with that said, let's get started. Number 10. There is a spot hidden inside of the Evermores called the Dragonwood. This is a deserted wooded ravine that many believe to be bewitched. The reason is because any non-sentient big mammal that enters the area gets teleported out. The wind in the area also whispers ominous sentences to those that stay quiet and listen. And trolls and giants also avoid settling anywhere near these woods. Now in the center of the Dragonwood, there is a permanently barren spot. And in there lies the Sleeping Dragon, the reason why the forest is named the Dragonwood. The Sleeping Dragon is a megalith of 20 feet long and 10 feet thick. Quote, Despite its name, this feature isn't a dragon at all, but an egg-shaped stone that floats in the air, unmoved by winds and all spells that have been tried against it. It was long thought to be an unhatched dragon egg, a belief still common in the north. The sleeping dragon is shaped like a large, long potato, a rough ovoid with its long axis horizontal. It floats in a fixed spot as the years pass, its lowest point about 10 feet off the ground. A little moss grows on the dragon and years of harsh winters have caused it to crumble in small ways here and there, but it exhibits no large cracks or breaks, and it seems to be protected against the fury of the elements. The dragon is fashioned from a single piece of unidentified dark stone. Its exterior was carved long ago into a seemingly abstract design of sweeping curves and flourishes. Sculpings that in some places reach a depth of a foot or so and cover most of the rocks' exterior. These carvings help conceal at least three hatch-like doors in the stone. Oval stone domes that can be shifted sideways to release cunningly carved stone catches and then swung open to allow access to hollows in the interior of the floating stone. End quote. What makes this artifact so particularly unique is just how mysterious it is. Nobody knows how it got there or who created it, and many sages and adventurers have tried to discern its purpose and secrets without much success. When you interact with some of its features, you can uncover secret doors and hatches in the stone that lead to either small chambers or to compartments holding different things. One example of a discovered function is what they call the wink. The wink is an opening with a treasure inside. The contents of the treasure is refilled magically every once in a while as long as it hasn't been plundered recently. You can find anything in there from ropes to clothing to bottles of ink or weapons or fancy candles. Anything can appear inside of the wink, but the contents will only appear to someone who has never looted it before. Another discovered hole is called the Dark Hole, that looks like a sepulcher or a burial cavity where people typically find either a dead body, a mommy, or skeletal bones in there. The bodies are always different depending on who opens the compartment. 
And then lastly, there is the wizard's door, which as you can see, is a form of cabin with a bed, a plethora of books, and different kinds of drinks for someone to get comfortable. The splendor is a part of the sleeping dragon that sages are sure is supposed to do something, but nobody has yet to figure out how to activate it. There are also reports of a village of pixies that live close by to the sleeping dragon that play tricks on adventurers who try and explore the artifact, casting illusory spells to make the sleeping dragon seem more ominous than what it is, or pranking the adventurers by making them believe that they have discovered a new opening in the rock. Number 9. Neushka, an old primordial artificer, is known to be the original creators of the Genasi. Allegedly, during the Dawn War, the war between the gods and the primordials, Neushka created the Genasi as slaves. Before she died long after the war, she created an artifact called the Birthing Furnace, which literally creates baby Genasi. When the gods won in the Dawn War, the planet was spiritually split in two. One was given to the gods, which is Toro, which is where all the adventurers are set, and then the other planet is named Abair, which is where the primordials live. And that is where the Empire of Dragons still exists, and is where the Dragonborn originally are from. In Abair, you will find the Birthing Furnace. Now, not much is known about the artifact itself, but it has the ability to create literal baby Genasis just like that. Whenever the settlement of Genasi in that region require more babies, they just activate the artifact and a baby is delivered. However, because of malfunctions in the artifact, only fire Genasis seem to be able to survive the birthing process. The rest are consumed by the forces fires before they can crawl out. Nowadays, you can create a Genasi by simply having an elemental reproduce with a human, the spawn which is a half elemental. If that half elemental then reproduces with another human, you will get the Genasi. The Genasi, which own the birthing furnace, however, are from the original strain created by the primordial a long time ago. They are sterile, for they were never created to reproduce. They are the first and original Genasi, so they rely on the furnace to replenish themselves and they called each other the Dominion of the Burned. Sky Cleaver is the axe of Anum the Old Father, the main center god of the giants, and its power is to cleave through anything, both physical and non-physical. The axe is said to be able to cut through any material, but its real power is to be able to split apart barriers, both physical and metaphysical. With the axe, you can separate truths from falsehoods. You can cut to the heart of the matter. With the axe, you could cut a curse off a person. You could sever a bad memory from someone's brain. Or straight up, simply physically cut through the strongest metals or stones. The caveat is that when you hold the axe, the weapon drains your corporeality. A person who holds the weapon for too long will become aged, deformed, and transparent as the axe severs your ties that bind your spirit to your body. Using the special cleaving powers of the Sky Cleaver will make this process go faster. To use any of its cleaving powers, one must invoke the word cleave, spoken in the ancient giant language. Another great power of the axe is that whoever wields it becomes basically immune to most kinds of damage. Now the axe itself, even though it was made for Anam the Old Father, it doesn't really have an owner per se. The axe appears to have a will of its own and goes to whoever calls it. Any giant or titan who wishes to call upon the powers of the Sky Cleaver must say in the ancient giant language, quote, in the name of Scoreo's stone bones, your maker, O Sky Cleaver, do I summon you into the service of my hand. End quote. If you say those words and your emotions are strong, the axe will fly to your service, even if the axe is currently in the hands of someone else. Essentially, whoever has the strongest convictions and emotions gets the axe. Those that find themselves in the presence of the axe feel an overwhelming desire to obtain it, and those that hold it find themselves constantly filled with fear that someone else might take it. Number 7 just like the Birthing Furnace, this is unfortunately another artifact that we currently don't have a lot of information about, but what it does is extremely cool. The artifact looks like a large apparatus that seems like a, a cross between a pipe organ and a printing press. Like a machine, it has multiple levers and knobs and buttons. Its power is that it could teleport a massive object and anything inside of that object anywhere on the planet. Essentially, if you had the astrolabe of Nimbral in your wizard's tower, you could teleport the tower and everything else inside anywhere in the world. You could teleport large ships, towers, houses, and with some extra magics, maybe even small castles with it. 
Last time it was seen, it was inside of the ship, The Realm's Master, a skyship captained by the wizard Dwalimar Omen in Haldra. The ship was destroyed not long after and reconstructed, but it is not known if the astrolabe of Nimbril was lost or reconstructed back into the ship. Number 6 in the Forgotten Realms, the Time of Troubles was a moment about 150 years ago to the present day, present being the time when the 5th edition adventures are set, in which gods walked the earth in their avatars. They did this because they were forced to. See, a group of evil gods had stolen a very precious artifact from the heavens, an artifact that we will talk about in the future, but since no god coped up to the deed, Eo punished them all by forcing them to walk the planet in their avatars. Now, Eo, if you don't know, is the overlord, is the god of gods. He controls basically all of them. Now, the thing is, if they died in the planet in their avatars, they died for real. This was done to force the gods to suffer some humility and to get closer to the mortals that gave them their power and, of course, to help them find the artifact. Mistra, the goddess of magic, being now on the planet, couldn't really protect, repair, and in general safeguard the weave of magic in the world, and as such, she seeked to force her way back into heaven. At the time, many magical problems were arising in the world. Whole areas of dead magic, multiple zones filled with chaotic energies, some spells just wouldn't work, and others that were meant to never work again could now suddenly work because Mistra wasn't overseeing them. For example, now someone might have been able to cast 10th or 11th level spells now that Mistra wasn't there to stop it. Now Helm, the god of guardians and protection, was left by Eo to safeguard the infinite staircase, the staircase that would lead to heaven in order to prevent any god from going back up. Mistra confronted Helm as she needed to get back to heaven and Helm and her both fought. Helm then struck Mistra down and killed her. The legend said that Helm deeply regretted the death of Mistra that he had been forced to carry out, and in his grave sorrow he cried a single tear which fell to the planet. This tear would then be called the Guardian's Tear and contained both the Vigilant One's anguish and the chaotic energies of the Lady of Mysteries. The artifact was always under the effect of a non-detection spell and whoever touched it would have all magic dispelled from itself. Whatever the tear touched, if it was magic, it would be dispelled. Furthermore, the tear held within itself such intense and uncontrolled magic that for one mile radius around it, magic would either fail to work completely or would become completely volatile and unrestrained. At any one point in time, there was a 1 in 4 chance that no magic would work around it, and 3 in 4 chances that magic would be unstable and chaotic. This bubble of anti-magic or chaotic magic around the tier would expand up to 30 miles at around midnight, making this an extraordinarily powerful artifact. It is said that those who gazed upon the beautiful blue crystal tear would see in the reflection a movie of the fight between Helm and Mistra from the point of view of Helm. The movie would play out in endless repetition for eternity. As an artifact, it was virtually impossible to destroy. Many sages actually speculated how a magical artifact of this nature could be destroyed and many posited that only Helm could if he were to crush it in his gauntlet so that Mistra could then absorb its magics. Others suggested having it be absorbed by a sphere of annihilation and then placing that sphere and living it undisturbed for 1001 years in the auras of 1001 magic elementals. That's how difficult to destroy these things are. Number 5 I'm not sure how to pronounce this one, but Krenshinibon, or the Crystal Shard as it is known, is an artifact originally created by seven powerful liches who wanted to create a tool of destruction that obtained its power from the sun, in a bid to insult mortals by making this artifact of doom obtain power from the sun, the giver of life. Upon the liches combining their strengths, they were obliterated by the chaotic energies and by the resulting sun-like properties of the relic, and the pieces of their spirits were absorbed by the artifact. The spirits sort of became the soul of the artifact, which had now grown sentient. Eventually, the Forgotten Shard was found by a good sultan who seeked peace with his neighbors, but the sultan was then further invaded by a warmongering sheikdom and defeated. The sultan was then forced to watch as his family was murdered right in front of him. 
the crystal shard would go on to absorb a piece of the Sultan's spirit. Now, the artifact imbued with the aspects of the seven liches and the tormented spirit of the Sultan would create for itself a personality, one of evil and despair who would stop at nothing in order to obtain as much power and as much glory as possible thanks to the scarring created by the traumatic and tragic events of its formative years. How cool is that? A sentient artifact that had such shit formative years that now it turned it evil. Now, as far as powers go, Krenshinibon could be used as a form of wand or staff or arcane focus in order to cast extremely powerful spells relating to fire or light, but its special abilities were incredible. First of all, the crystal shard could create a duplicate of itself that if buried under the ground, would sprout and grow into a massive crystal tower called a Crystal Tirith. This tower was impervious to all damage and reflected all attacks back to the source. Its only weak spot was a pulsating crystal that worked as its heart, which hid inside of the tower itself. The tower's door was invisible and undetectable. To top it off, the crystal's tower absorbed the light of the sun during the day, making it even more powerful and giving some of that strength to the original crystal. You could create many of these towers at a time, but doing so would spread the power of the shard thin. The other main power of the crystal shard was that it could communicate mentally to those weak of will and persuade them to join his cause, or rather, the cause of whoever wielded the crystal shard. It would collect slaves this way with promises of riches and greatness and have them fight for it. Even though the crystal shard had an owner per se, it was its own master and if given the opportunity, it would seek to get rid of its current wielder in order to find a better and stronger user. Krenshinibon was eventually destroyed via its only weakness which was dragon fire applied to the original crystal. Number 4 well, now we're getting into the good stuff. Jizan was the goddess of fruitfulness, fertility and productivity in Saqqara. And it is said that this coin was given to the owners by the goddess herself in order to bestow prosperity to the bearers. Whoever held the coin became more skillful in general, but specifically in matters relating to business and mercantile affairs. It is said that their business never suffered any ill fortune, that their livestock exclusively gave birth to twins and their crops were always bountiful. It is also interesting that because of the power the coin gave to the bearer, it was always coveted and feared by many caliphs, who often found themselves the subjects of revolts led by popular coin owners. Many caliphs, for this reason, would go on to ally themselves with coin bearers instead by marrying their daughters away to them. There was a caveat, however, and that was that as much as the coin blessed the bearer with all of these effects, it actually hated greed. Those who would abuse the power of the coin to amass too much personal wealth would find themselves cursed. The curse would force the individual to consume large quantities of food and drink and seldom be satisfied by them. Imagine a fat, greedy pig of a person. That's what this would make you if you abused it. The only way to get rid of this curse was to simply pass the coin over to a stranger. The coin was always meant to be shared in order to increase the prosperity of everyone, not just of a single one person. The only way known to destroy the coin of Jizan would be to have it be crushed under the heel of a Tanari lord in a land stricken by famine. If the coin also were to be thrown into the river Styx, it would be destroyed, or if a thief who truly desired nothing were to bit the coin in half. Number three. I love the magical chessmen. So essentially, the artifact itself in its full completion looks like a chessboard with chess pieces, but instead of a black and white set of pieces, you have a side that is red and a side that is green. Each piece is unique in the way it looks and is supposed to represent people from Shesenta, a location in the Forgotten Realms. The pieces themselves are made with loose peel, an ore that is slightly magnetized so the pieces would feel magically attracted to the steel chessboard. Now, each piece itself works as a ring of resistance. By holding any of the red pieces, you get resistance to fire, and by holding any of the green pieces, you get resistance to lightning. All you had to do was hold a piece in your hand to gain the benefit. 
On top of that, the pieces would respond to two different magical command words that would activate their innate special powers, and this is what made them so darn interesting. Activating the command words on any particular piece would actually transform you into the representation of the piece with powers and equipment. For example, the red pawns transformed you into a lowly thief, but using it on a red bishop would transform you into a mid-level cleric. Red knights made you into mid-level fighters, the red king made you into a high-level fighter, and the red queen made you into a high-level mage. For the greens, a green pawn made you into a minor fighter, uh, green knights made you into a mid-level ranger, bishops into mid-level druids, green kings into high-level rangers, and the green queen into a high-level mage. The rooks on either side would instead transform into massive towers in the same way as the Darren's instant fortress. In any case, you would hold the piece and say the command word and you would instantly transform. You would lose your own abilities, but then you would gain the abilities and weapons and levels of the appropriate piece. When the effect was done, whether because you died or an hour had passed or you had said the command word again, then you would be restored to your normal self and any injuries on you would be healed up. The piece would then not be able to confer that ability again for another 24 hours. Each piece also had a second command word that you could use and doing that would act a form of bag of holding that was unique to the piece. Pawns had a smaller size caps than the more powerful pieces, for example. The drawback, however, for this command word was that once you put something inside of the pawn in this way, it was tricky to get it out because you couldn't get something specific out. When you wanted something out, things would come out randomly instead, which was a pain in the ass. Now, the chess pieces were incredibly difficult to keep, especially in populated cities because they were enchanted to be magnetically attracted to magical steel. So if a person walked by you with a magical blade, there was a small chance that one of your pieces would teleport over to the pockets of that person walking by. The pieces were also enchanted to stick together, so if one piece teleported somewhere, then the other pieces would soon follow throughout the day. It is said that there is no magical or mundane way to stop these teleports from happening, and anything that's tied up to the piece when it teleports will also be teleported as well, so you couldn't just tie them up to your belt or something, your belt would then be teleported alongside them. Being an artifact, of course, the chess pieces were nigh indestructible. There were only two ways to destroy them. One was to have the god Torm, god of law, duty and righteousness, play the Red Knight, goddess of strategy and battle tactics, in a chess game using the pieces. The gods would animate the pieces and have them fight in the chess game. The pieces that fall in the game would then be destroyed permanently. The other way of destroying the artifact would be to have something similar, but instead have a demon and a devil fight in the chess game in a battle in the Blood War. Either case, regardless of who won the game, the chess board would end up destroyed permanently and would disappear forever. Number 2 the legend says that a follower of Soon, the goddess of beauty, lived his entire life attempting to preserve his beauty. So much so that he eventually forsook Soon and instead petitioned many gods for a way to enhance and preserve his appearance. We don't know which god answered, but we know that it offered him the portrait. Since then, it has been passed down through millennia. Now, the portrait looks like a simple blank canvas, but if an individual were to keep possession of it for at least a week, the image of the individual would then show up on the canvas. From that point on, the owner will no longer age, and instead, the image in the canvas will age in its stead. For as long as the person kept ownership of the canvas, he would look just how he was when he first got it. It gets more intense than that, though. Any type of injuries or wounds that would be associated with attacks or magic would not affect the individual that owned the canvas, and instead, it would also be reflected on the canvas. All penalties, all injuries, all aging would be absorbed by the portrait and the painting of the individual would show all of these features. If the artifact were ever to be destroyed or if the owner would lose ownership of the painting, then all of those penalties would then be visited upon the subject of the painting as it should be immediately. Number one. The all-knowing eye of Jasmine Sierra is a large opalescent strip of fabric decorated with signs of truth, vision, and prophecy. It is a veil if worn by a woman, but if worn by a man, it turns into a kefia. Now, originally, the legends say that a great ghoul, which is like an undead genie from the desert lands of Saqqara, had a stolen mortal bride named Jasmine. 
He knew she hated him and as such he used a considerable amount of his power to fashion a great artifact that would allow Jasmine to find the true beauty of the realm he had conquered. He hoped that she would fall in love with him as soon as she saw how beautiful and how grand his empire was. Instead however as Jasmine used the veil and explored the land she imbued the veil with all the power that she could, binding the spirits of dying ghouls to the veil in order to protect her from her forced husband. As with all ghoul magic, the effects worked too well and in time the veil hid her from her husband's sight perfectly but it also altered the true sight that the veil gave, showing her only what she wished to see. Now this artifact is so far my favorite out of all of the artifacts that I have seen so far in Dungeons and Dragons. See the veil's powers as one wields it are already pretty strong. You get true sight which is great, you become invisible to ghouls which I suppose is only really useful in Sakara. You also get many effects like non-detection and some spells that you can use daily like shape change and alter self. But the true kicker is that it slowly but surely the veil will try and transform the world into your perfect world. It'll start to show you only what you want to see. At first it'll start with small changes, maybe that nasty sit on your husband's forehead will disappear. Maybe that nasty smell from the sewers on your way to work will stop smelling foul. Then as the months will start passing by the effects will become stronger and stronger. The words of friends and relatives are no longer heard unless they match your dream reality. You simply won't see what you wouldn't want to see. You stop feeling what you wouldn't want to feel. Whatever the character's dream world would look like, the veil will continue to shift your perception and make that your reality. Eventually halfway through the process the person will simply not refuse to remove the veil, even while bathing or sleeping and then your character will believe that he or she is living in a perfect world, whatever his or her idea of a perfect world would be. And to everyone else the person would simply look like a very optimistic happy fellow that really likes to wear that very same veil. As an artifact this destruction is virtually impossible. The only ways known to destroy this artifact would be if it were to be worn by a blind god, if it were to be thrown into the shadow fail while wrapped in a cloak of shadows, or if it were to ever be carried to the heart of a black cloud of vengeance by a willing cleric. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters Walker, Motley, Jacob Schrader, Zach Bowell, Rocato Fan, Barry Maskant, 5e Magic Shop, Daniel Umar, Rusty Rain, Morgan Johnson, Biotechnofrag, Daniel Luna, Doug Feeder, Dr. Cowbell, G Herc, Red Soul Knight, Brad Salazar, The Great Codini, Terry Culp, Baracus Law, Omega Scales, Karathas the Bulwark, Ozol, Sound Tech, Siri, Alex Cookson, Square Chicken, and Ariel Nelson for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. All right, guys, thank you once again for a second time. So much for watching. Uh, I would like to announce that I have donated the money uh, for this month's Patreon to International Rescue Committee. Uh, they're basically an organization that spreads all around the world and they deal with all kinds of, uh, of problems, whether there would be earthquakes or hurricanes, tornadoes, you know, what have you. And of course, pandemics, they... Uh, they're kind of dealing now with the uh, coronavirus in, in specifically in places that don't really have the infrastructure that we may have here uh, in the U.S. to to help those that are in need. So um, yeah, at this point in time, I felt like them and, and many others, of course, are in need of those donations. And like I promised you guys before, at the beginning of the month, I would be donating uh, all my earnings for Patreon this month to a, a, a just cause for uh, for the COVID pandemic. Uh, so there you guys have it. I just want to announce that uh, to let you guys know which um, organization I, I picked for the donation. And, and once again, thank you so much for uh, donating and for allowing me to obviously like give this money over to charity. I appreciate it very much. You guys are the best. And um, with that being said, for a third time, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.